Hi everyone, you're very welcome to this Science Week event, which is running as part of Limerick Festival of Science. My name is Dearne O'Kiley and over the next half an hour or so, I'm going to tell you some stories from Irish maths history and about how Ireland has contributed to the advancement of maths and physics around the world. Part of the reason that I want to do this is that we tend to talk about maths in a very exam focused way in Ireland. And a lot of you will be familiar with these little pink booklets. But we don't do and teach maths just so people can do exams. The exams are only supposed to be a marker along a much more important uh, and meaningful story. We do maths so that we can use it to understand the world around us and so that we can enrich our experience of the things we see. And even simply so that when we hear people talk about things like statistics on the news, that we really understand what's going on. So our story today is going to start in the early 1800s. And those of you who study history will know that this was really a very miserable time in Ireland. There was poverty and there was famine. Uh, and that was partly because we were under direct rule from London. But, but for science and engineering across Europe, it was actually a really exciting time. And there was a lot of progress happening. So people were studying things like how objects move and energy, and also how things like light and electricity and magnets behave. So for example, the first battery was invented in 1800 by an Italian physicist called Alessandro Volta. And only the next year, uh, an English physicist called Thomas Young used something called the double slit experiment to show that light is a type of wave. And you learn about that in Leaving Cert Physics. And then it was only a few years later, uh, in 1805, that a French physicist called Ampere uh, discovered the relationship between electricity, magnetism and motion. So he figured out how you can use electricity to make things move. All of these advancements in science and physics drove advances in mathematics because new, more complex maths and more abstract maths was needed to describe these new things. Uh, and to understand these new things. At the intersection of it all was an Irish man called William Rowan Hamilton. So Hamilton was born in Dublin uh, on Dominic Street, which is quite close to O'Connell Street. But he was sent by his parents to live with his uncle, who was an Anglican priest. Uh, and so he was raised in Trim in County Meath. His uncle thought that education was incredibly important. And when Hamilton was a child, he learned many different languages, but in time he developed a passion of his own, and that passion was for maths. So when he was 18, he went to study maths at Trinity College Dublin. And then after he finished his degree, he got a job as a professor there. During his career, he developed new ways of using maths to describe how objects move, and he invented uh, a new set of equations for something that nowadays we call Hamiltonian mechanics. Now, over the centuries, different mathematicians have come up with different equations for mechanics, which is the study of how objects move. Back in the 1600s, a man called Isaac Newton came up with a system based on forces. The idea for this system was to write down all of the forces on a body and then use a rule called Newton's second law, which states that the forces, the forces on a body are equal to its mass multiplied by its acceleration. So the idea is that if you know how much an object weighs, so you know its mass, and you know what force it's experiencing, for example, because you're pushing on it in a well-defined way, then you can figure out how it will accelerate. And once you know the acceleration of an object, you can work backwards to figure out how fast it's going to go. And once you know how fast an object is going, you can work backwards again to figure out what its position will be as a function of time. That is, to figure out what distance it will travel. And this system of working backwards from acceleration to uh, speed to distance necessitated the development of a new area of maths called calculus. And that's something, again, that you can learn in Leaving Cert Maths. 
So this method of looking at the forces of an object constituted a huge step forward in people's understanding of how to model or describe motion using equations. But it does have limitations. Now, if you do leaving cert physics, you'll learn about something called the pendulum, and that's made up of a weight hanging on a wire or a string. The weight experiences two forces. It experiences the force of gravity pulling it down, and it experiences a force from the wire or string, which is holding it up. And you can write down equations using the laws of motion from Newton that describe how the weight will swing over and back. But things get more complicated if you introduce more forces. So, uh, for example, a, a swing in a playground is a real life example of a pendulum. And you can use the laws to describe a pendulum to de describe how you will swing backwards and forwards on a swing and how long that will take. But the problem is that when you're in a swing, you don't just sit there. You push your legs forward when you are moving forward and you pull your legs back in when you're moving backwards. And we all do this naturally because we know that it helps us to swing higher and faster. But from a maths point of view, if we try to think about what forces that corresponds to, it's really difficult to write down the force that you cause uh, when you just push your legs out in thin air. So to describe systems like that in full detail, you need a better way of, of, of writing down equations. Now, Hamilton's approach was to forget about forces and instead think about energy. Energy can come in lots of different forms. So some examples of energy are heat and light and movement. The last one is called the kinetic energy of an object, and that depends on its speed. There's another type of energy called potential energy. Uh, and in the situation on a string, that's measured by how high up you are. So Hamilton basically came up with a new set of equations that only just required you to understand those two energies and how they depend on your position, so your height, and your velocity, so your speed. Uh, and he came up with a new quantity, which we now call the Hamiltonian, which was the total energy, so the sum of these, these two things. And what's really great about this system is that you don't need to know the forces at all. Now, these equations here are the ones that he wrote down to describe the problem. They might look quite strange, but they're actually based on the same mathematics calculus uh, as the Newton system is. And what's pretty cool is that this system of equations developed by an Irish person is something that you learn if you study physics at university anywhere in the world. So these equations can uh, deal with all of the same problems as Newton's laws can, but they can also answer bigger questions, like how planets and stars interact. And these equations are still used today in groundbreaking research. And as I said, there's something that everyone who studies maths or physics learns about at university. Now, when I look at this story, I see a trend from everyday things that we can touch and feel up to more abstract ideas. Uh, and that trend is not specific to Hamilton. It's a trend that I think exists uh, throughout all of physics and maths, and maybe science in general. So let me explain to you what I mean. In the early days, physics focused on tangible things like position and speed and weight. And those are things that we can uh, touch or feel or experience for ourselves. So for example, if I pick something up, I immediately get a sense of whether it weighs a lot or not. Uh, and the maths of the time reflected this. So for example, we use division to calculate speed as the distance divided by time. As time went on though, uh, people started studying things that are more difficult to experience uh, and that we see in an indirect way. So for example, we and our bodies can't feel electricity or feel magnets, but we can use uh, an electric circuit to use electricity 
to light a light bulb, and then we see the light instead of feeling the electricity. And similarly, we can use a magnet to move an object, and even though we can't feel the magnet, we can see that the object is moving. And what we'll see later in the talk is that the focus moved on again to even more abstract uh, and subtle things to do with an area called quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is the study of things that happen at, at atomic scales. And it's so subtle that people didn't even know it existed for thousands of years, but it's become more and more important as we've learned more about the world around us. So as this uh, trend from things we can experience directly to more abstract things has happened in physics, the maths that we use has also had to adapt. So for example, in the equation that we used to advertise this talk, uh, we had I, which is an imaginary number. Uh, we had H bar, which is a funny looking symbol, but is just a number. Uh, we had this fraction with curly Ds in it on top and on the bottom. Uh, and that's something that comes from calculus and it describes the rate of change. Uh, and then we have this big symbol, which is called Psi, uh, and it describes something called a wave function, uh, which I'll come back to later. Uh, and then there's this number H, which is Hamilton's number, the one to do with total energy. So there's been shifts in the way people thought about the world and how maths was used to describe it. Uh, and Hamilton was a really important player in that shift. He was an incredibly fortunate person because his job came with the right to live in Dunsink Observatory, uh, which I think is just very cool. And he lived there with his wife and his children and his sisters. So as well as doing maths, he did other activities. So for example, he wrote poetry uh, and he actually exchanged letters and poetry with William Wordsworth. As he became famous for his work in maths, he and his wife were expected to host uh, important and famous visitors in their home. But he did also continue his work in maths. So he developed uh, a new, whole new branch of mathematics called quaternions. And to understand those, we need to think about something called real and imaginary numbers. So in primary school, we would have learned to add and subtract, and we would have relied on the number line to do that. So the idea is that we can write all of the positive and negative numbers on one line. And we call those the real numbers, but they don't encompass everything in the world of maths. So uh, moving beyond that, in multiplication, we would call three multiplied by itself three squared. So three squared is nine, and then we say the square root of nine is three. Similarly, we would say that the square root of four is two, and that the square root of 25 is five, because five by five is 25. Now, the problem arises when we try to calculate the square root of something like minus nine, because the answer is not any of the numbers on that real line. Because if you think about it, three multiplied by three is plus nine, and minus three multiplied by minus three is also plus nine. So any real number squared is positive, and that means that the square root of a negative number can't be a real number. Uh, it's a new special type of number, that we call imaginary, and we denote with a letter i. So now we have two types of numbers, real and imaginary ones, and we can add them together to make what we call complex numbers. The problem is that there's no space for these numbers on the number line. We need to draw them on a special new plot called an Argand diagram, and that's the plot that I've shown uh, in the bottom left of the screen. So on this plot, you put real numbers on the horizontal axis, so that's still a number line. And then you put imaginary numbers on the vertical axis, and you put complex numbers in between. So for example, to get to one plus one i, so real number one plus imaginary number one, that's a complex number, you go across one and up one, and then you'd mark a line on this plot. So what Hamilton was thinking about is that these numbers aren't just a curiosity, they're totally essential for describing real physical things like waves. And Hamilton knew that if real numbers live on a line, which means they live in one dimension, 
And if these complex numbers live in two dimensions, because we draw them on a plot with two axes, then he thought if he could come up with a three dimensional version, uh, that he would be able to use those again for real important tangible things. So to describe uh, things like rotations in space. And he had some idea of what those numbers should look like, but he for a long time couldn't figure out a way to multiply and divide them. Well, he couldn't until one day he was out for a walk along the Royal Canal in Dublin with his wife. And he was, you know, thinking and thinking and thinking. And eventually he had a flash of inspiration. Uh, and he wrote about it to his son later in a letter. Uh, and what he said was, although your mother talked with me now and then, yet an undercurrent of thought was going on in my mind. An electric current seemed to close and a spark flashed forth. The herald, as I foresaw immediately, of many long years to come of definitely directed thought and work. And then he says, nor could I resist the impulse, unphilosophical as it may have been, to cut with a knife on a stone of Broom Bridge as we passed it, the fundamental formula. I really like this description, actually, because uh, it describes something that for me is really familiar. You know, that idea when you're going about your life and you're maybe in the shop or in the kitchen and you're trying to hold a conversation with someone, but at the same time, you have this knowing problem bouncing around inside your head and it's really irritating when you can't figure it out and then when you finally do it's just so satisfying and I think that's exactly what he's talking about here and I think he's probably described it better than anyone I've ever seen described it before uh, and Hamilton he really did take out a knife and scratch his equation into the stones of the bridge and unfortunately, it's not there anymore, but there is a plaque erected there uh, in commemoration of him doing that. And if you go to Dublin and walk along the canal, you can see it for yourself. Now, Hamilton's math mathematical discoveries, they genuinely changed the world. So Hamilton mechanics is taught to every university physics student around the world, and it's used to study hundreds of different problems. The math that he developed now is used for problems that weren't even known in his lifetime. So, for example, Hamiltonian mechanics and quaternions made space travel possible, which I think is just ridiculous because he wasn't even thinking about things like that, the idea that people might want to go to space. Uh, but on that more modern problem, what we're going to do now is move forward to the 1900s uh, and talk about some other mathematical stories. So in the 1900s, work started on a new area of physics, and that area is called quantum mechanics. So I mentioned it briefly earlier. Up until this point, people have been studying what we call classical physics, and that's to do with how everyday objects in our world behave. So in classical physics, we say that something like a slitter has a position and a speed, and we can measure those things using things like rulers uh, and timers. Now, the better our equipment, the better the measurement we can make. And in principle, if we have perfect equipment, we can make perfect measurements and know exactly where something is and exactly how fast it's going. In classical physics, if you hit a ball, it will respond in a very predictable way. So a really good Komogi player can hit the same ball in the exact same way, with the exact same hurl, in the exact same conditions, over and over, and make the same thing happen. So they can make the ball go in the same direction at the same speed. We call this a deterministic system in the sense that what you do determines what will happen. OK, and in this theory, light is a separate thing. It's a form of energy and it travels like a wave. So we don't kick or push or hit light. Its movement is governed by other behaviors like reflection and interference. Now, quantum mechanics uh, is completely different because these concepts get really jumbled up uh, and the world, in my opinion, becomes a lot more difficult to understand when you use quantum mechanics. So in quantum mechanics, when we try to measure the position of something, we can and we get a result. But if we measure the position again, we'll get a different result. So in quantum mechanics, something can be in two places at the same time. 
and if we measure it many times, we'll get many different answers. When we do this, what we're actually doing is building up uh, a picture of where something is most likely to be at any one time. Uh, and we call that picture of where something is most likely to be a wave function. And so when I mentioned earlier that symbol psi in the equation that we advertised with, um, that's a wave function and it describes basically this picture here on the screen, which shows that something has different probabilities uh, associated with where it might be, and then it's most likely to be in one place. We call this now a probabilistic system as opposed to a deterministic one. And in this new system, uh, light and things like waves and particles, which are solid objects, become uh, a lot more jumbled up. So in this system, we say that light is a wave, but it's also made up of very small things called photons, which behave like particles. And similarly, an object like a ball is made up of particles, but if we look at those particles in the right way, uh, meaning if we look at them on a very, very small scale, then we see that they behave like waves. Uh, and that's actually the meaning behind Einstein's famous equation, which I've written down here. So it basically says that mass, so a particle being a solid real thing, uh, is just another type of energy. Just like heat and light and sound are types of energy, weighing, having a weight, having a mass is another type of energy. So his formula said the energy, the energy associated with mass is the mass multiplied by the speed of light squared. So there was this whole new area of quantum mechanics and one of the biggest contributors to that new theory was an Austrian physicist whose name was Erwin Schrödinger. In the 1920s, Schrödinger developed a brand new equation and it became central to quantum mechanics. So we call it now the Schrödinger equation. Uh, now, usually in my job as a mathematician, I use maths to describe physical systems. Uh, and so I would write down equations that describe the position and speed of something. This equation is kind of weird because instead of describing position and speed, it describes the probability of you having a particular position or a particular speed. And it does this by treating particles as waves. And it actually uses a version of the Hamiltonian developed by our 19th century Irish friend, William Rowan Hamilton. Again, he did this long before people started thinking about quantum mechanics. Now Schrodinger came up with this equation, but he actually didn't like the fact that quantum mechanics relies on probabilities rather than on definite outcomes. Uh, and to demonstrate why he didn't like it, he developed a thought experiment that nowadays we call Schrodinger's cat. And he used to illustrate how strange quantum mechanics is. So just like the way an object can be in two places at the same time, Schrodinger's cat equation said that a cat could be both alive and dead at the same time. Uh, and this picture is actually probably the most famous part of all of quantum mechanics today. Uh, and it's famous because it takes these kind of strange, abstract, difficult to understand new ideas, and it connects them to something that we understand and care about, a cat. So at this point, I hope that you're getting the impression that this guy Schrodinger was a really big deal because he came up with the cornerstone equation and the way we understand this whole new field of, math, of, of physics. He even won Nobel Prize for his work. And these are things that I guess every university of physics student around the world will tell you if you ask them about quantum mechanics. But what a lot of people actually don't know is that this guy Schrodinger lived and worked in Ireland for 17 years and he even had an Irish passport. To understand how this came to be, we need to think back to what was happening in politics at the time. So those of you who study history will know that the first half of the 20th century was a time of huge change in Ireland. So there was an Easter rising in 1916 and after this came the War of Independence. The War of Independence led to the establishment of the Irish Free State, but that in turn was followed by civil war. So it was a very tumultuous time and we still talk about a lot of the major military and political figures from that time today. So we would often hear names like Michael Collins, 
W.T. Cosgrave, Eamon de Valera and Arthur Griffiths. Now, as it turns out, one of these people, Eamon de Valera, was originally a mathematician and he played a really important role in Irish maths history. So I'm not going to say anything today about uh, his politics or his involvement in um, any of these important developments in Irish history. I'm instead going to talk to you about his life as a mathematician. So De Valera was born in New York, but he actually grew up in County Limerick. Uh, and before the 1916 Rising and the role in history that we most often know him for, he was actually a maths teacher and he taught in schools in Tipperary and in Dublin. He was intrigued by Quaternions, for example, uh, which were one of William Rowan, Rowan Hamilton's great discoveries. Uh, and De Valera even scratched those equations into the wall of his cell uh, in Kilmainham Jail after the 1916 Rising. Now, De Valera went on to become the Taoiseach of Ireland. And during the time when he was Taoiseach, Europe was changed forever by World War II. So Adolf Hitler became the Chancellor of Europe of Germany in 1933 and he promoted the anti-Semitic and racist and homophobic and ableist agenda of the Nazi party. And when this happened, Schrodinger had been working in a university in Berlin in Germany, uh, and he and his family left Germany and moved to Oxford in England instead. So that appointment actually didn't work out though, and it seems to be partly because Schrodinger and his wife had an unconventional relationship. Uh, and at the time when they moved to Oxford, Erwin Schrodinger was in relationships with both his wife and another woman, uh, and they all lived together in the same house quite happily. Nowadays, we would call this an open relationship or a polyamorous one, and we would describe what happened next as discrimination because Schrodinger's personal life wasn't accepted in Oxford and job offers from other universities uh, fell through as well. So it was a place where he and his lifestyle weren't accepted. And as a result, he and his family ended up back in Austria. But the fact that they had left Germany when the Nazis came to power had marked Erwin Schrodinger out as an opposer of the Nazi regime. And he was fired for what they called political unreli unreliability. And what this really meant was that he lost his job because he was not a Nazi. De Valera saw an opportunity and through secret intermediaries he had a message sent to Schrodinger inviting him to Dublin to join a new research institution and through secret intermediaries a secret message came back and it simply said yes I will come and despite the problems that they had encountered in more liberal England visas were sorted for the entire Schrodinger family uh, and they all moved to Dublin So in 1940, then, De Valera founded DIAS, which is the Dublin Institute for Advanced Studies, and it still exists today. What De Valera did was kind of audacious, I think. So he had thought previously about setting up an institute of learning. But when it opened, there were only two schools. There was a school of Celtic studies and a school of theoretical physics. And theoretical physics had just one person in it when it first opened, Erwin Schrodinger himself. So although he had this idea, de Valera, of setting up the Institute, really it happened so that this Nobel Prize winner, God of Physics, would come and move to Dublin and bring his brilliant mind with him. Having said that, more people did follow soon after. So later that year, a second scientist arrived from Germany. Uh, and then those two people were joined not long after by an Irish mathematician called Sheila Power and a Chinese physicist called Huang Wupeng. And together, this group of academics gave uh, lectures and they were of a standard that hadn't been available in previous, previously in Ireland. And really they together changed the face of physics in Ireland. Now I want to pick out one person from this group and tell you a little bit more about them. And that person is Sheila Power. So she was born Sheila Power and when she married, she became Tinny. And the reason I want to tell you about various parts of this story is that she was only 23 when this group was founded. So in the kind of job that I do, 23 is incredibly young to get any kind of fellowship like this. 
Uh, and power got hers as part of this group that included someone who had such a long career already that they were a Nobel Prize winner. So what this tells us is that without a shadow of a doubt, she was an absolutely outstanding theoretical physicist. So Power was born in Galway in 1918, and the year that she sat her leaving cert, she was only one of eight girls in the country to get an honours in maths. So in terms of gender roles, and you know, the perception of what girls did and didn't study, it was a very different time with very backwards attitudes. And the fact that our world is so much better now is in part thanks to trailblazers like her. So like Hamilton, Power had a creative side, as well as being a gifted mathematician, and she was an exceptional pianist and singer. Her children are still alive today, and they'll tell you that she shared this love of music with her family. She studied maths at university in Galway and the UCD, and she graduated at the top of her class. She was awarded a scholarship uh, to travel abroad to study for her PhD, and she went to the University of Edinburgh, and she studied under someone called Max Born. Now this guy, Max Born, was another Nobel Prize winner, and he had moved to Edinburgh after losing his job in Germany because he was Jewish. Together he and Sheila Tinney and some other physicists studied crystal lattices, so the structure of solid objects that are made up of crystals uh, and the stability of those things. So they published their work in a series of groundbreaking papers, uh, and Perra wrote one of these all by herself, and another one together with a fellow student called Juan Wu Peng, who had studied uh, with Bourne after traveling uh, from China specifically just to do that. So Sheila completed her PhD in only two years. And to me, that's incredible. Nowadays, we would consider four years-ish uh, uh, a kind of a typical amount of time to take to do your PhD. And the fact that she did hers in half that time again, just shows us how good she uh, was at what she did. She's also thought to have been the first woman born and raised in Ireland to earn a PhD in maths anywhere in the world. Uh, and after this, she and her co-author, that guy Juan Wu Peng, who she wrote a paper with, both took up fellowships in Diaz in Ireland on the same day. So this is a photo of the group in Diaz in its early years. It had a mixture of homegrown and international talent, uh, and they were teaching and researching quantum mechanics and other subjects on a level that hadn't been possible previously in Ireland. Uh, so this was an absolute step change in Irish mathematics and physics and science, and it put Ireland on the world stage, and that excellence of research um, continues across Ireland today. So in the front row of this picture, there's De Valera, who was born in America but raised in Limerick. Uh, and Schrodinger, who grew up in Austria and worked in Germany and England before arriving in Ireland. Behind them is Sheila Power, who was born in Galway, studied in Scotland and then returned to Ireland. To one side of her is Ernest Walton. So he was from Waterford, uh, but moved to the UK as part of his work. And he went on to receive a Nobel Prize for helping to split the atom. Uh, and then on the other side is Huan Wu Peng, who travelled from China via Scotland and then came to work in Dublin and later uh, became part of the Chinese Academy of Sciences. So coming away from this talk, I hope you've learned about a small sample of the really great things that Ireland has given to mathematics. So from Hamilton's Quaternions to uh, Paris' study of crystals to the founding of this research centre in Dublin um, and giving a Nobel Prize winner a safe and welcoming home in Dublin in a time of international crisis in Europe. In return, I would say that Ireland has benefited greatly from this international engagement, both in terms of Irish mathematicians and scientists and students being able to travel abroad to learn, and in terms of others travelling here to study and work, bringing with them, you know, new skills and ideas and energy. So my colleagues here in the University of Limerick and across Ireland are still working on these kinds of questions and problems today. Uh, and there'll be many more exciting problems to do maths about in the future. In the meantime, there is lots more great events running throughout this week as part of the Limerick Festival of Science and nationally as part of Science Week. Uh, and you can find more about 
all of these on Twitter, on the University of Limerick and Mary I websites, and on the SFI webpage. So I'm going to be joined for the last few minutes by my colleague Catherine Timoney. Uh, we work together in the Department of Maths and Stats in UL. And between us, we do lots of different things. So we lecture and research and work with companies to do maths, and we organise events like this one. Yeah. Um, thanks very much, Darren, for your talk. It was very enjoyable. And now we just have a few questions um, for you. So the first question is about um, what did you decide to do in university and, and what were you what were you thinking about when you made the decision? So I did theoretical physics in UCD um, and I had I had like a huge list of things that I was interested in, but I really liked maths and physics in school and almost everything on my maths on my list involved maths or physics. So I had like all the physics degrees in the whole country and all the maths degrees in the whole country. Um, and I chose one that had some of both, but I think I could have done any of them and been happy. I guess yeah, you, was, you were similar? That was quite similar for me. Um, I had quite a long list of different things that I was thinking of doing. And the common thread through them all was maths. And after looking into them, some of them weren't mathematical enough for me. So <laughs> I went for um, full maths. And actually, I took quite a different route of doing maths and history of art. And after my undergraduate, then I, I um, went fully into maths. So all the way. It's a different option. Yeah. Yeah. Um, the next question I have for you is, do you have any interesting projects that you've been working on recently or what kind of work do you do? Um, so most of the research I do is about working with applications. So for example, working with a company who has a problem um, that you need maths to solve. So uh, I guess one example is I worked with a company who make the screens for things like smartphones. Um, and sometimes when you make these thin glass sheets, they come out at the wrong thickness. And so I used maths to describe the, the process that was used to make the sheets and understand why sometimes they're the wrong thickness and how you fix that. Um, the last question then I have for you is that we're hearing a lot about how maths and statistics are used um, to help in the fight against COVID and we hear a lot about from um, the modelling team and do you can you tell us anything about that? Um, well so I, I mean I don't work on this myself but I guess within NEFIT there is this modelling advisory group and it's a group of mathematicians uh, from across Ireland who use things like calculus, which I guess I mentioned in the talk, and statistics um, to understand various aspects of the disease and how it propagates and what's happening right now. Um, so they, they take different bits of maths and then they put it all together to get a picture of what could happen in different scenarios and what's happening in the country right now. And then that feeds back up into NEFID, which is then used to make um, recommendations for what we should do going forward. Mm. Yeah, so it's it's uh, probably the most important math that's ever been done in the country. Yeah, it's quite it's quite nice to see um, how important uh, maths is in that, um, in studying the virus and figuring out what's going on and planning for the future with it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's all the questions that we have for you today, Darren. Uh, thanks very much again for giving the talk. It was really enjoyable. Um, for those of you who want to learn more about maths or the other um, science events, we have plenty more on for Science Week, and you can see the full list of those on the SFI Science Week website. Thank you very much again. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Bye, everyone.